Okay, thank you everyone. Um, welcome back uh, to this second panel of the Forest Futures uh, Conference. Thank you, Gary, for inviting me to participate in the conference. I'm Pablo Perez Ramos. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture here at the GSD, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce you um, very briefly the speakers of this second panel uh, of the conference, uh, which is entitled Decoding the Urban Forest. So we're going to have, uh, first of all, uh, Michael Jacob, um, who teaches comparative literature at uh, Grenoble, history and theory of landscape at uh, Geneva, and aesthetics of design at uh, HET uh, Geneva as well. He's also a visiting professor at the Academia di Architettura di Mendrisio and at Parma University. So his teaching and research uh, focus on landscape theory, aesthetics, the history of vertigo, contemporary theories of perception, and the poetics of architecture. Um, the title of his talk will be The Heterotopic Other. Then we'll have um, um, our second speaker, set of speakers are Max Piana and Nicolas Pevsner. Max Piana is a research ecologist at the USDA Forest Service uh, Northern Research Station, and he's based in Amherst, Massachusetts, with a research focused on advancing evidence-based management and design of urban green spaces from, streetsca to, from streetscapes to natural areas. Nicolas Pevsner is an assistant professor in landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania's Whit Whitman's uh, School of Design, with research focused on ecological systems and their integration in the, into design, the design of renewable energy landscapes and speculative designs for decarbonization. Uh, the title of this second presentation will be Beyond the Acts, Reimagining Silviculture and Design. And uh, lastly, we will have Achem Atapboteng, um, who's a plant ecologist affiliated with the Ecosystems Group at the Environmental Ch Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Uh, formerly, he held the research director position at Yale's University's Urban Ecology and Design Lab, contributing to the development of green cooling uh, tower technology for infrastructure cooling and carbon sequestration. Uh, Achem, um, Title, uh, talk title is Concrete to Canopy, Nature-Based Urban Adaptation. So um, we're going to be, in this second panel, just a one minute introduction, we're going to be looking again at urban forests uh, as those liminal spaces uh, where the urban condition intersects with that otherness that the forest uh, is. Uh, but also urban forests at those areas where the degree of design um, in forests probably reaches its peak. We will hear about historical examples of urban forests. We will hear about the transposition of forest management practices into urban forest. And we will look into the potential of these conditions, the urban forest condition, to help us navigate the future of our cities and of our panel, of our planet. So with that, I'll leave you with uh, Michael Jacob and the first speaker of the panel. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, thanks a lot. So I will speak partly about history, so at least Ed Eigen should be happy with what I will try to present to you. So I start with uh, the first image is uh, Alan Soundfist's Time Landscape. I think it's particularly interesting because uh, it was started in 65 and it is a reconstruction of a small urban forest before colonization in New York. Uh, before uh, going on, I will just have to see how I switch the slides, yeah. Uh, before going on, I want to, for a moment, uh, just stop and ask, uh, what is an urban forest? Do we really know what uh, urban forests are? And is this not an oxymoron? Is it not a contradiction? We know that we use uh, different forms. Uh, uh, we speak about urban landscape. We speak about urban agriculture. Uh, how can a forest be at the same time urban? And what happens? between the two, uh, the urban, the city, and the forest when uh, they come into contact. Um, forests are, of course, uh, made of trees. And uh, if we think about forests uh, and trees, uh, we have to uh, take into consideration what we could call the symbolic. Um, we could remember that Shakespeare, when uh, uh, at the Globe Theatre, he wanted to show a forest. Uh, 
they took one single tree, and the single tree became the metonymy of uh, a forest. So uh, for, uh, the tree has uh, symbolic value, and uh, uh, this is uh, especially interesting if we think about uh, uh, De Saussure. You remember De Saussure, who is a founder of modern linguistic. And um, when he tried to define the sign the famous uh, distinction between signifier and signified, he used the tree. So the tree is a sign of signs. The tree is the sign of all the signs. And at the same time, we know exactly that the tree is uh, polysemic. It has different uh, values. It depends on the context. This is Ian Hamilton Finley trying to <clears throat> define the larger context of uh, ways to enter to, to reflect about the concept of trees. Um, in 1927, the Russian constructivist uh, artist Rochenko made this photograph. And uh, it was published next year in a journal. And he was attacked by uh, colleagues and by the critics because they said this is a bourgeois image. And uh, it wouldn't be uh, something in line with uh, the new socialist ideology and program. And in order to defend himself, he said, well, uh, trees, uh, I was not interested in trees, and nature is completely boring for me. I am someone who lives in the city, and uh, nature is something which belongs to another history, for the former history of Russia. But for me, a tree is like a pylon. So he said uh, there is an identity between trees and pylons. Um, and of course, uh, this brings us back to uh, the polysemic character of uh, trees. So trees have uh, many things to teach us. And we already spoke about uh, the origin of uh, architecture. This is uh, uh, an Italian painter, Piero di Cosimo, where we see uh, our ancestors uh, at the moment when they invented language in order to communicate, they started to build. And uh, building meant uh, using uh, these columns. And the columns were, of course, um, trees. And uh, Piero di Cosimo, very intelligently, in another famous painting, uh, <laughs> tries to reflect about uh, the way we have to sacrifice forests in order to start civilization. So we have uh, the beginning of civilization. At the same time, we have a disappearance and the extreme danger to destroy our forests. This is still something which speaks to us today. And of course, this uh, will become uh, uh, an important uh, element in uh, the reflection on um, architecture, on the origin of architecture. And uh, it is very beautiful present in Thomas Cole's house in the woods where we see that uh, uh, the cabin is built by wood. So it is a sort of participating. It is participating in nature. It's a natural vernacular architecture. But at the same time, we see the price, the destruction of nature, both in the front, where we have all these ruined pieces of wood, and then in the backyard, where uh, we see what it's a price we have to pay in order to build. Someone who, uh, <clears throat> another thing which comes immediately to mind is um, a topos in European culture and in Western culture in general. This is Virgil, the first eclogue, something which everyone had to learn by heart until the 18th, 19th century. Uh, and this is Titurus, uh, <clears throat> the shepherd, who uh, has the chance uh, to be protected by a tree. And here again, the tree is a metonymy of nature. So you see, um, trees and, of course, forests as a plural of trees have uh, <clears throat> a lot to say uh, about uh, how we use them in a symbolic way. I want to go uh, one step further and uh, propose uh, maybe a very rapid typology of possible um, urban forests. So, there is a model upstairs where we have uh, the forest as a sort of implant, the forest at the center of the city. Then we have uh, forests, uh, several forests uh, as a system. Think of uh, the emerald necklace. Then we have a third possibility. We have uh, at the fringe, at uh, marginal forests, uh, and the relation uh, with the city. And then uh, 
of course, um, uh, a city uh, surrounded uh, by uh, forests. And the last example would be uh, another possibility where the city enters into, uh, there is a sort of corridor in order to um, create a strong contact between the forest and the ur urban environment. Uh, I want to illustrate this very quickly by uh, several examples, all taken from Paris. Um, you will see why I choose Paris, because I think uh, there is uh, both historically and structurally a lot to learn uh, from what happened in the last four or five centuries in Paris. Um, John Ruskin wrote a famous book called Mountain Painters. Uh, we could think about a book which has never been written about forest painters. And forest painting is very important because it influenced our way to see forests and to interpret them. And this is, of course, one of the most important um, paintings of the 19th century, Déjeuner sur l'herbe, and it is uh, situated in a forest. Uh, let's start with the first example. This is Cour la Reine. It's a um, park, an urban park built 1616 by Maria di Medici. And the idea was, uh, you will see, uh, I will show you another image of uh, Cour la Reine. The idea was to build a urban forest, which was at the same time a park. And uh, she built it because she was from Florence, and she missed Italy, and she missed the Corso, the place where people would walk around. And so she um, built this uh, garden in Paris, not far from the Seine. And it became a model uh, for uh, a lot of constructions uh, uh, around the world. Uh, the drive at Central Park is uh, still influenced by this very, very special place where, for the first time, people would not only walk, but they would take carriages. So they would enter a sort of closed world. It's like a sort of Formula One uh, circuit. And they would enter and drive around. And at the same time, it was um, the 17th century Tinder. So people would come, uh, come together, and uh, all kinds of exchanges took place in this uh, uh, very, very peculiar environment. So this is a first example. The other is here, um, the other place, Florence, Italy. So a link between Paris and this place at the center of Paris, built by the Queen, and uh, uh, a sort of nostalgic element, looking back and looking to her um, own history, personal history, uh, linked to um, Florence. The second example is the Bois de Boulogne at the left-hand side of uh, the map. You see Paris uh, is a very, Paris is a very good example uh, for uh, the one model I tried to um, present, where we have uh, marginal forests, which become extremely important. First of all, uh, the Bois de Boulogne and then the Bois de Vincennes. Uh, Paris is still very much the <clears throat> fortified city, which we know. and. Uh, Especially in the 19th century, the Bois de Boulogne became a, a very important element of uh, landscape architecture. And um, this was uh, the Bois de Boulogne was the Bois de Rouvry. Uh, it existed. Uh, we have the first uh, elements of its history in the 8th century, so 1,200 years ago, and then it got it became smaller and smaller. Um, and uh, in the 19th century, Alphon, uh, one of the main figures in the transformation of Paris under Baron Haussmann, um, transformed uh, completely the Bois de Boulogne. 200,000 trees were planted, uh, uh, two lakes were created. Uh, a train line was built in order to bring all the material there. And another train line brought the people from Paris to the Bois. So we see. Uh, a forest, which is just on the edge, and the relation uh, between the two, which becomes important. And uh, again, it's an engineered landscape. Everything is designed. The forest is designed too. <clears throat> and uh, many, many important protagonists, especially landscape architects, worked on this. So we have Barrier de Champ and uh, other people who are very present in the transformation of Paris at the same time. 
you see here the contact between the city and the bois, uh, the forests, and we see the old fortifications which are still there, and then they have been removed, and the city uh, expands. So there's a relation, and um, the um, Déjeuner sur l'herbe by Manet uh, is uh, an image showing a uh, prostitute with probably two clients, two friends, uh, and it is, of course, in the Bois de Boulogne. Here again, you see the Bois de Boulogne uh, as something which looks extremely natural, but actually it's uh, construction. Here we see how it looks today. And uh, of course, it became one of the main places where painters would go in order to get inspiration. Uh, in 1867, uh, the, um, <clears throat> another important uh, project is built by uh, Alphand. It's uh, Les Buts de Chaumont. Uh, Les Buts de Chaumont, which um, used to be a quarry. And uh, this is how it looks today. Many people who go to Paris think this is a natural place, and it has always existed there. And uh, it has an important forest uh, at the center. <clears throat> Here again, this is completely fake. Even the <clears throat> rocks are a gigantic collage. And in 1867, even the train uh, passed in between. And uh, this is a citation of many places, Normandy. And especially, we have uh, uh, La Forêt Vosgienne, the forest of the Vosges. Uh, the Vosges are a huge forest at the center of France. So uh, for many reasons, uh, probably linked to, for, to the interest of fresh air, hygienic uh, transformation, um, the Buchamont uh, were created as an artificial system, as a completely artificial system with a lot of concrete, etc. But the other which they wanted to cite <coughs> was uh, uh, a forest at the heart of France. So it became a sort of symbol of uh, France altogether. This is how it looked before the transformation, the quarry, and then it became the park, which was uh, the main event of the World Exhibition in 1867. Uh, at the end of the century, 1897 to 1918, uh, Albert Kahn, a, a banker from Alsatia, uh, built a garden too. Uh, it's in the periphery of Paris again, and there are three forests, and one of the forests is again La Forêt Vosgienne. So you see how uh, a forest, uh, which we saw before, uh, a sort of citation of the national forest of France, reappears here. Uh, he was originally, he came from a region from the north of the Forêt Vosgienne, but he wanted, he reproduced the south, southern possibility because he wanted to have granite. So uh, this again is a, composition. It's a very careful composition, citing other examples. Um, another step, the Très Grande Bibliothèque, um, the library in uh, National Library in Paris. Uh, Dominique Perrault wanted to build a sort of uh, terrace or a bridge in order to cross uh, at least from one place to another and to, to somehow touch the forest. 126 uh, trees coming from Normandy, which were a citation of the forest of Fontainebleau, but President Mitterrand said, no, you cannot touch my forest because it's like the president. You cannot touch the president, so it has to be untouched. And uh, only some goats, so three years ago, some goats were introduced here, so they're the only, only living elements uh, in the Très Grande Bibliothèque. The promenade plantée, the last example, <clears throat> it's a forerunner and the model of the Highline Park and uh, former railway <coughs> system, etc. And here we see how the city at the end of the 20th century tries <coughs> to create a corridor between everything which is built <coughs> in the city and the outside, which is the Bois de Vincennes. Um, Urban forests are now very much uh, fashion in the city of Paris. There are at least three important projects on the road. Um, it's interesting to see that they don't cite anymore. There is no more a central model, but uh, simply to bring the forest into the city. And this uh, almost metaphysical place, Place de Catalogne at the heart of Paris, uh, will be transformed into uh, an urban forest too.
So in order to conclude, I would say what is the most important element uh, if we look to this development is um, the other, which is uh, present by citation or by allusion, shows us that urban forests in Paris, but not only, are always translations. They're transpositions. So there is a system of rhetorics which uh, defines the existence of these forests. And of course, uh, this is linked to ideology. Or we could say it's linked to ideology and to classical rhetorics. So I would say urban forests in Paris and in other places are collective speech acts. And we have to try to interpret them in this way and not only to look to all the other aspects, which are, of course, fundamental. Thanks for your attention. Good afternoon. We've hit noon, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be presenting with my colleague, Nick Pevsner. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary uh, collaboration that's really built up over a decade of us working together uh, in a long friendship. Um, I'm also going to start with some definition. Urban forest is a complex term, as Michael has introduced, and we heard Dave Nowak, Novak in the previous panel introduce forests at this kind of larger scale, which might encompass all the trees in the city. I think it's important uh, operationally to unpack that a little bit and think about the different types of trees and landscapes that are included in that definition of urban forests. We have street trees, yards, landscape parks, and forests and cities. These are all biophysically very different in terms of the ecology of those sites and the management considerations um, that we might consider there. For today's talk, we're going to focus on these for on forests and cities. Now, these are biophysically akin to rural forests. What we would think traditionally as a forest. They have trees that dominate the canopy, a relatively unmanaged understory, and the trees that are present have regenerated. So they're not planted, they're coming up on themselves. Within a city, though, these, these forests are also confronted by multiple stressors that are just common to urban ecosystems. So uh, increased temperature, altered climate, pollution, high fragmentation, and people. Um, Individually, none of those invasive species. Individually, none of these are really unique to forests, uh, to cities and forests and cities. But within cities, they're multiple, they're co-occurring, and they're often exacerbated. And so these can have important consequences for the forest dynamics uh, that occur. If we unpack this a little bit more operationally for designers and for managers, we can think of different typologies of forests and cities. So we have designed forest parks. Some of these large forest parks that we were just introduced are newer designed natural areas like Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, we can have remnant forests, afforestation sites, so sites that are now typically run by municipalities, so these large scale plantings. And we have spontaneous forests where abandonment might have occurred and forest has just come up on its own. Uh, these sites, at least in forested biomes, are common and abundant. In the U.S., there's 1.7 million acres of forest natural land in cities. 84% um, of U.S. parkland, or city park, municipal parkland, is natural areas. And when in forested regions, that's primarily forest. They're also really important. So we know that these forest sites offer a disproportionate amount of the ecosystem services. When we're considering carbon, they're incredibly important in terms of the urban uh, carbon sequestration and storage footprint. They offer cooling benefits, biodiversity and habitat, and they have many social amenities as well. Of course, people can access them for recreation, and it's often the primary, if not the only, experience with natural land and nature that urban residents have. So a survey in New York City found that for 50% of residents, these sites were the only nature or natural, natural land that uh, residents experienced. Um, when it comes to the management of these sites, they're often undermanaged, neglected. This is a, a, an issue of resources, um, but also just 
uh, uh, a misunderstanding perhaps of the stewardship that might be required. When stewardship does occur, it's often in the form of plantings, exotic or invasive plant removal. Um, but given their biological similarity to forests, that let this uh, traditional ecological framework, such as silviculture, which we heard previously mentioned in the, in, in the last panel, uh, lend themselves to these sites, right? So silviculture, many of us might associate it with extraction, with harvest techniques. But at its core, it's an ecological framework that is, is the art and the science of growing trees or tending and stewarding trees in the forest. Now, this management's not commonplace in our forests and cities. Uh, and it's not, and, and, and the recognition of the potential to adopt a silviculture uh, within cities um, is maybe longer, uh, has, uh, has more historical roots than we uh, recognize. In fact, Olmsted, uh, quite quotably, uh, was calling for an urban silviculture when he said to plant thick, thin quick. Um, and so in this, this essay between Olmsted, uh, that Olmsted and J.B. Harrison wrote, on, in the use of the ax, um, they discuss not only the benefits and the potential benefits of sustained management of these large forest parks, the introducing of thinnings and, and silviculture, um, but lament on the public resistance uh, to, the, to the introduction of these cuttings, any kind of active management following the planting. So, more than 100 years later, I find myself having very similar conversations with my colleagues, both practitioners, scientists, people in cities, outside of cities, about the potential for a silviculture uh, within these forested landscapes and cities. And we've proposed, my colleagues and I, an urban silviculture as a conceptual framework. And so this is borrowing from traditional forestry approaches, but with an understanding of the social, ecological context of these sites, right? So in some cases, borrowing directly from traditional approaches, and others, you know, seeing opportunity to modify, but also the opportunity for innovation and novel strategies. For today's talk, we're just gonna focus on kind of the management actions, but I would say that this is a concept that we can bring up to how we assess, how we monitor forests, how we set goals and objectives. Um, but, in its basis, silviculture is a field-based operation management act, uh, action, and um, it's, it's informed by a deep understanding of forest ecology and forest dynamics. So in the top left, you see what I'm calling traditional stand dynamics, how a forest grows, develops, and changes over time from the early establishment of seedlings up to a mature forest and the disturbances uh, that might occur. So we heard uh, Jonathan talk about hurricanes, right? These can be gap type disturbances like we see on the top right there. Silviculture can mimic and leverage these ecological phenomenon to direct a composition or a forest structure um, that's desired by uh, the society or the, the landowner in this case. So in, in this case, we might mimic a hurricane with a clear cut or a sol group selection cut to increase the amount of light and have species that thrive in light, perhaps oak, uh, to come up in that space. Within urban systems, these stand dynamics can be impacted by those multiple stressors that I talked about. And this can occur at all those different stages. So a silviculturist has to understand the potential and the limitations of each of these stages, and then they manipulate them. So if we return back to that gap example, when a hurricane comes or trees are lost in an urban forest, it's not necessarily true that trees will reestablish. In fact, what we often see is this pervasive vineland that can occur in arrested succession, and that site can transition away from forest for a long time, if not impermanently. Uh, so what we're exploring is how to take different traditional strategies of silviculture. These occur at those different stages in forest uh, dynamic, stand dynamics and, and within the, the successional trajectory of the forest. And think about what we can borrow and adapt and apply them in terms of a, a toolbox, we might say, of urban silvicultural prescriptions. Just to dig into a couple of these a little bit deeper, if we think about early forest establishment, stand, what are called stand initiation strategies, 
Within traditional silviculture, we might lean on the passive ability of seeds to come in, naturally disperse into a site and grow. So that's where we do these uh, clear cuts or selective thinning. Um, but in urban, we might have to be more intentional. We might have to plant. So Stephen Handel and George Robinson and Fresh Kills Landfill planted uh, fruit dispersed trees, clusters of them to attract birds and allow more species to migrate and those groves to expand across the site to accelerate the, the forest succession process. And the bottom right is a, is a study site of mine in Philadelphia in which we're using hybrid willows and poplars, so using phytoremediation techniques, but thinking of them as nurse trees to capture a site and, and nurse the more desirable, we might say, later successional trees on those sites over time. Um, and if we revisit gaps, understanding that gaps can be problematic in cities, we're exploring alternatives for using existing gaps, how to treat within those sites, protect, and perhaps directly plant to facilitate a new uh, kind of understory that is robust and resilient to the different stresses of urban environments. So this is similar to, again, what Jonathan was talking about, Harvard Forest, Hubbard Brook. These are long-term research sites. We don't have those in our urban settings. But these are dynamic systems that are ben would benefit from networks of exchange and long-term research. So we have, just to highlight a couple, uh, the, Herb, uh, the Forest and Cities Network is run by the Natural Areas Conservancy, um, is a national network of, of managers and scientists across the US uh, that work in these landscapes. And I have co-led and developed the, the Northeast Urban Silviculture Network, which is a group of, of scientists and practitioners, urban and rural, looking to replicate studies across cities in the Northeast. And so through this work, we're building off of what Olmsted was talking about when plant thick, thin quick, and starting to answer just how thick you have to plant and how quick you have to thin. Um, I'll end before just passing it off to Nick here, is that urban silviculture is drawing from these traditional rural practices, but it's also drawing from urban practices, arboriculture, restoration ecology, and design. Um, and I think, and through its development, it will inform both of those practices. Nick's going to dig in a little bit more what that uh, exchange interaction looks like with landscape architecture and silviculture. Thank you so much, Max. Um, so what can design do with an urban silviculture? And what can it offer back? Um, so for the last half century, ecology has constituted one of the core competencies of contemporary landscape architecture practice. Um, yet the integration of ecological theory and dynamics into landscape design is, I would say, still emerging and still incomplete. Um, although in recent decades, landscape projects have aspired to play with and showcase ecological concepts and processes. So field operations, process drawings of the thread thicket plantings, for example, incorporate ecological concepts of forest succession. But are there opportunities for designers to um, incorporate ecological concepts uh, even deeper and make even better use of the emerging body of tested and experimental ecological knowledge to more precisely steer design landscapes development over time? Some designed forest projects explicitly take on silviculture. So in projects like Devine and Del Noquiz, we have a whole concept based on the spatial qualities that emerge through thinning. So direct planting to quickly establish the initial tree cover, and then subsequent spatial definition from the retention and release of selected trees over several rounds of tree removals. Or if we take Brooklyn Bridge Park by MVVA, which used what foresters might consider a nurse tree approach, um, where planting of an early successional plant community dominated by staghorn sumac um, sets up the preconditions with small oaks and sassafras interplanted below to quickly produce the structural qualities of a more mature forest. And then over time, the sumac is thinned while the oaks are allowed to grow through and become the dominant canopy, a form of silvicultural release. Um, could it have gone further? Um, while the cut sumac stumps, in this case, and the changing light regime year over year offer clues of a very active forest management, um, we don't have explicit interactive signage or public tours around these, uh, around these management activities. We don't have a counterfactual forest nearby that could be compared against. So these clues remain visible only to the trained eye. 
Ever since Olmsted, some major challenges for silviculture have been the gap in the public's literacy of forest management, its reflective defense of trees despite what forests' ecological health might demand, and in land managers' difficulty in communicating intent and future outcome. And as Joan Nussauer has highlighted, there's also a disconnect between the public's understanding of ecological function and its desire for neatness and order. And so it demands a process of translation from ecological patterns into cultural landscape, the need to frame ecological function within a recognizable system of form. So can landscape design with its tools for producing legibility in designed landscapes help to overcome this gap? to improve the public's ability to understand urban forest management and its ecological dynamics. Perhaps here we can take advantage of the typology of the humble trail, one of the more potentially didactic typologies of landscape experience. Interpretive trails have also been used by forest managers to teach silviculture uh, to students and foresters, um, teaching them about how active forest management techniques can happen and what their effects are. So the red front trail at the Yale Myers Forest, for example, um, is uh, a version of an interactive trail, uh, interpretive trail, that traverses a number of different forest stands, which have each received one of a variety of silvicultural treatments. And then interpretive signage, in combination with multimedia materials, explains the ecological and silvicultural dynamics at work at each stop, um, at each silvicultural treatment. Landscape architects, um, we think of ourselves as skilled at the manipulation of visitors' emotional affect. We alter the sequence, the rhythm, the proportion, the juxtaposition of various spatial moments. We use variations in tree density and vegetation type, topography, constructed vista, alternating light and shade. Um, case in point, the landscape laboratory in Alnarp, Sweden, developed over 30 years by Roland Gustafsson which threads walking trails through a diversity of silvicultural treatments. So one might think of this as part art installation, part educational project. Um, this landscape is certainly expanding the vocabulary of what kind of spatial and emotional effects are possible using silviculture. But what if these kinds of spatial manipulations were to be combined with more explicitly edu educational displays? Might they start to build up public literacy of forest dynamics? Could designers curate a set of given silvicultural treatments in demonstration plots or demonstration forests against the counterfactual of an untreated plot to show effects over time? Can they stage forest management activities as performative public events, help teach urban publics what a healthy and resilient forest should look like and what kinds of management is required to keep it that way? We have yet to design such examples, but to advance this idea, designers need to be involved. Okay, so we've talked so far here about primarily a northeastern US perspective, and specifically about forests in cities. But these concepts are also translatable to, uh, for example, wildland urban interfaces, and perhaps even beyond. So there are other forests where public perceptions of what a healthy forest should look like that don't align with contemporary ecological understandings. Um, across the US West, for example, a century of fire suppression has resulted in a historically high stand density, which is now colliding with climate-driven drought and higher intensity fire, and upending what a resilient forest needs to look like moving forward. These forests also need a shift in public perception about what forest management needs to look like in our climate-changed Anthropocene world. And so in a set of landscape architecture studios that I've taught at UPenn, looking at this phenomenon, um, students learn what a healthy fire-adapted forest should look like. They visit treatment sites where ecological thinning or prescribed fire have been applied and learn about the kinds of labor, the facilities, the infrastructure that are needed to accomplish this kind of work at the scale needed, which will entail cutting some trees, yes, and making peace with that, um, while also suggesting ways that design can help produce the kinds of multifunctional, educational, and interactive public experiences that can help to gradually shift perceptions. The ultimate goal is a more legible, more resilient, and as per some of these students' explorations here, a more reparative and perhaps more decolonial model of land management. Coming back to cities, these are forests that will see the, the, the coming climate stresses first, that will experience pest and disease outbreaks first. So to prepare them for these future threats, it'll be important to manage for resilience. In forests that all too often lack age diversity, it means a focus on increasing species mix and structural diversity. Um, forests in cities can be a living laboratory, as Olmsted had long called for, testing and proving forest management best practices for the Anthropocene. But the spatial skill set of designers is needed to inform how to steer these landscapes. 
we can include the acts, but also innovate. So being responsive to the complex ecological and social dynamics of cities. And so in bringing foresters, ecologists, and landscape architects together, urban silviculture can also bring design back into the longer term management of forest landscapes, a realm all too often handed off to professional land managers once the design phase is over. And so ideally, urban silviculture can help visitors understand forest management itself as a kind of ongoing design practice, a spatial choreography that they can see developing over time. With increased public literacy of the value of selective thinning, the public might become a better steward and advocate for sustaining urban greening initiatives beyond the initial planting campaign. Going beyond seeing forests as passive green spaces or as simple escapes to nature, perhaps it can learn to read the trees of the present in the context of past actions that have shaped today's forest or as antecedents of the future forest where contemporary actions are clearly linked to future outcomes. In this way, perhaps the public can move from being passive consumers of visual experience in landscape towards active participants in a collective project of landscape stewardship. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back in New England. Um, my previous speakers have done a brilliant job um, by both uh, bringing a bit of history and then also uh, making an attempt to define um, what urban forests are. Um, I was struggling, so in my case, um, I tried to consult AI. Um, but before then, uh, to, before I show you um, AI's uh, perspective, uh, I just wanted to make a point that um, um, when you think about the history of uh, human civilization, uh, from, back from hunter-gatherers uh, era, we all um, have been very close to nature, and over the you know trajectory of time, have sort of moved away from nature. So it's not really uh, a bad idea when we think about rewilding re um, um, human um, spaces. Uh, so what does AI say? Um, uh, oh yeah. This is the idea of um, futuristic urban forests. Uh, and so I tried to change the search parameters to see if there will be you know, further options. Uh, this, this one looks like a post-apocalyptic zombie world where human beings are extinct. You know? um, <laughs> uh, but when you think about um, AI models, it's all based on um, existing data, right? So you train the models, and so this is not far-fetched from our own figment of imagination. However, um, these emphasize on aesthetic orderliness, uh, but not necessarily the replica of forests. I'm talking about the AI's perception of what future forest will, uh, urban uh, forests will look like. Uh, and that's fine if the goal of, let's say, urban forestry is uh, um, just as forest, um, forestry can be managed for, let's say, timber. Um, now, I try to um, ask AI to generate uh, temperate forests, and this is its impression. So I also sort of uh, add in uh, diversity, and then a nice uh, bird appears. Um, then tropical, and this is what I see. And then, um, um, you know, although the, the natural forests aren't aesthetically ordered um, compared to the futuristic uh, perception of green space, yet we can agree that it has its own aesthetic appeal um, with some added layers of complexity. So both have aesthetic effects. Um, urban is ordered by design and natural forests probably by biological processes. Um, so urban forests um, may, from the AI's perspective, may not mimic natural forests, uh, even including in practice um, sometimes. Uh, but this is very important when we want to throw in resilience variable to urban layer as we think about future, how um, um, urban uh, forests will survive future uh, climate scenarios. So which of these scenarios, if I should ask, will be resilience to projected um, climate scenarios? Um, and before I try to attempt to maybe answer, I'm not going to answer, uh, we're going to think through it. Um, I want to just present a few basic facts. So in the next three decades, um, more than half of the world's population will live in cities, uh, meaning uh, increased demand for infrastructure, energy, food, water, 
And, and as modernization removes us from further from nature, uh, forested cities will reflect uh, probably true human dwelling. Temperature and water um, happen to be um, uh, water availability happens to be a main uh, climatic forcing variables that is normally um, um, affect us in different ways. Uh, when you think about drought as a function of temperature and water, um, it's one of the causes, significant causes of tree mortality. And this is an example of um, a three uh, consecutive years of uh, drought in California. <laughs> and when you look at 2021 and 2022, it looks like um, there was not a single place uh, without drought. And we've also learned a lot about, um, over the decade, about how uh, the scientific basis of drought induced mortality. Uh, this paper in, in HR. Um, nicely summarize the biological events that takes care or occur during drought um, induced um, stress. Um, so, in late terms, we are losing trees to um, and key ecosystems. I think some in the previous panel there was a mention of mangroves. Yes, we are losing mangroves as well. Over 400 million um, trees was lost uh, in the past decade between just California and Texas, and so you can imagine the rest of the world. Um, not only is drought um, um, having impact on forests, um, it's actually one of the biggest threats to global food security. This is an image from Kenya, where I have been in the past. I actually flew from Nairobi, um, and we are doing some drought projects there. So as you can see, uh, it's quite um, rough. And um, after, for the first time in COP28, um, uh, food uh, systems uh, became one of the three um, climate agendas. Temperature also um, affect, we all know, uh, I think it's not news, uh, especially if you're from West Coast, and maybe also from Australia. Uh, we had a devastating uh, fire event. Um, now, um, what we normally don't talk about often had to do with um, um, leaf temperature. Uh, so this curve um, shows the relationship between leaf temperature and photosynthesis, um, and I want us to pay a bit of attention here. Um, so the blue curve, uh, for, first of all, um, just for background, uh, plants are categorized into three groups, the C3 plants, the C4 plants, and the crossylation acid metabolites. Um, the C3 plants are predominant, uh, predominantly about 85 to 90% of land plants, and, and then the C4s are maybe less than 5%. Uh, example is corn, and sorghum. Uh, so C3 plants are mostly most trees, and mostly uh, where we get our source of food, um, rice, um, wheat, and, and others. And, and then uh, we have a bit of the desert plants. Um, interestingly, um, it turns out that most of these, uh, be, be, you know, uh, um, most of these plants are not going to probably tr uh, survive or beyond a certain critical leaf temperature range. Um, and so, uh, regardless of, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, we are going to have uh, a problem when. Um, the leaf temperature goes beyond range. Uh, most plant species will not survive. Uh, and so when plants fail, we know that ecosystems will collapse and literally maybe the end of civilization. Um, in this paper, just uh, I think last year, uh, the, they showed that the critical leaf temperature beyond which photosynthesis in tropical trees begin to fail was uh, 46 degrees Celsius. And we know tropical trees account for a quarter of uh, global carbon, um, contain about 96% of um, species, and also together with savanna account for 60% uh, um, GPP. Uh, but unfortunately, as small differences in um, air temperature causes disproportionate um, increase in um, uh, leaf temperature, as you can see, uh, there are a few species that are already hitting, uh, going beyond the critical um, um, leaf temperature. And, and so this is a very um, a serious problem. And it means that um, a small increases in mean global temperature can have this disproportionate um, adverse effect on uh, forests. Uh, McDowell suggests that um, these are, must be the three important um, factors to safeguard forests, um, forests uh, in, in the future. Okay. 
Now, on diversity, the first point, um, he argues that uh, diverse species and traits will enable um, future forests to survive. Um, as shown earlier, photosynthesis be begin to fail even beyond um, the critical temperature, uh, regardless of um, uh, regardless of uh, uh, the species or physiological, the range of physiological traits. And the second point suggests that increased CO2 impacts uh, will impact on um, carbon and water relations. Uh, the only problem is that uh, some studies try to do uh, CO2 manipulation studies and then some kill the trees, uh, which and they show that there was no positive association uh, of uh, elevated CO2 on survival of trees. And last point, uh, increasing mean annual precipitation. Well, of course, um, increasing precipitation increases tomato conductance and carbon assimilation. Um, nevertheless, you beyond uh, the critical temperature, um, leaf temperature, you know, latent heat um, you know, declines, and, and then uh, leaves approach boiling point, and this for the surface of evaporation, um, um, even at the local uh, climate, and leaves becomes irre irrelevant. And this is why in the savannas and in the desert, there are sparse uh, vegetation, uh, and, and, and that um, zero fires it probably evolved um, a reductive uh, leaf forms. So, I, you know, to, to, I thought, um, to really safeguard forests, uh, one of the things that we probably also have to think of is um, uh, you know, uh, uh, resilience. Um, uh, forests are ecosystems, and as um, Alan Kovic put it, um, ecosystems are complex adaptive systems um, that can respond to disturbances by the maintaining self-organizing um, resilience. And when extreme conditions, as earlier shown, uh, disturb the biotic community, the co ecosystem collapses. And the emphasis here is on biological community. And, and a resilience system also maintains state awareness and operational normancy, even in response to disturbances. So, a resilient system should uh, have attributes such as um, high sensitivity of some of the community members to serve as early warning indicators, while the rest of the community prepares response to eliminate, distribute, or modify uh, the, dis the disturbance state. Uh, so back to the question. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it turns out that uh, the resilience of biological community be becomes fundamental to the survival of forests. Uh, therefore, uh, we have to look at forests and the implementation of forestry concept beyond the visible vegetation or uh, maybe biomass productivity point of view. Rather, um, as networks of interconnected uh, and interdependent biological community that share varied functional and structural traits uh, that provide us um, collective ecosystem services. So this means we have to uh, maybe probably begin exploring uh, additional tools and concepts that allow us to examine forests uh, in its total complexity and form uh, from a resilience point of view. And I'll quickly um, you know, conclude um, by highlighting uh, some of um, emerging ideas. Some are quite old, but you know, have not been pushed to that much. Uh, and that is. Um, uh, looking at um, landscapes uh, in the context of energetics and metabolism, uh, and also uh, figuring out how to predict resilience. Uh, from, from, from energetics and metabolism, as you know, all ideas of uh, plant relations and um, vegetation models, including the basis of most manage, uh, forest management principles, are founded on carbon flow in the context of productivity. Um, but it's by far the most inconvenient way to study ecosystem productivity and global carbon cycles and climate change. Uh, but as we think about resilience, uh, it becomes limiting uh, because um, it becomes limiting in capturing the essence of ecosystem complexity that is vital to predict um, resilience. So from productivity point of view, um, we can derive um, energy flow from uh, the famous um, uh, you know, equation of photosynthesis. Uh, but what this uh, perspective also um, help us is uh, we can, uh, allows us, it allows us to, us to think about forest as an outcome of energy, uh, and, and a concept that, is, that was pioneered by uh, uh, Ray, Ray, Raymond Lindemann from Yale. Um, we can also appreciate um, uh, the various scales of ecosystem services and de develop metrics that identify who really contributes to what. 
And we, we often say that forest is the dominant um, 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 component of forest ecosystem, but when we change the perspective, um, carbon sequestration and biomass production can form, forms less than 10% of, um, 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 when you think about things in the energetic flow. We can also uh, calculate um, um, energetic channel winner index, uh, which simply kind of tell, tell us about who is, which species are you know, contributing to what in the ecosystem. Um, for just a, an example, uh, this is, uh, um, this is uh, the terrestrial flow of um, uh, energy flow um, uh, calculation uh, on, on, on land, and it's about uh, 150 terawatts. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then uh, this, uh, this is also when you use the same concept. Uh, the ocean also um, have about 120 terawatts. As you can see, they are not too different. But uh, in our conversation of um, safeguarding the climate, the focus have always been on terrestrial land. Uh, now, how do we predict resilience? That's a, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to uh, kind of uh, do something unusual. I'm not going to talk about forest, but not too far from forest. And it's, uh, it's about chocolate. Um, so, um, not because we are in a Valentine mood, but um, uh, it's an interesting question. I thought, uh, well, we have data, and it sort of uh, could be a nuance on how we think about f f uh, resilience. Now, so I want to use the data from cacao system as an example. Now, by the way, um, Cacao agroforestry uh, turns out to be half higher GPP than uh, secondary tropical forests, but not maybe uh, rainforests. Uh, um, but um, but also, well, I love chocolate. Um, uh, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so yeah, it's a main ingredient of chocolate, and it's also a major cause of deforestation in growing regions, and uh, it supports um, an annual revenue of uh, 500 billion even though the projection uh, is quite not realistic. Um, so when you think about cacao, um, uh, that's, a, that's a very tiny little flower. That's the cacao flower. Um, but cacao is visited by multiple um, arthropods. Uh, and this is how the network looks like. Um, I use um, uh, an algorithm called Keiko decomposition uh, that allows me to break down uh, the cacao system uh, to its functional core. And this allows me to uh, cut kind of, uh, as you can see, this is the entire network. And all these scenarios represent a possible network in a single uh, cacao flower. And as you can see, uh, this represents the, the system core, the network core so that in every possible scenario, there have to be uh, these two species which co-occur. And so that's the Tessanopteral group, and then the Diptera, the midgets, and then the trips. Um, now, yeah, OK, that's it. When you see, you understand. <laughs> so that is the, that's, this is how it looks like. The, 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 it's not like, like little mosquitoes, very annoying. Um, and then this is a trips. Now, for us, you can see that trips exist in like a community, so they are part of the, their cycle is part of the flower, whereas the diptera kind of visits and then pollinates. All of these, these guys are pollinators. Uh, and then um, they themselves and their, you know, their friends you know, uh, are, are, are incredibly um, important uh, structural and functional part of the um, cacao uh, system. Now, without them, there's no chocolate. And so if I, ask, if I had asked you what is the most important thing to think about in order to sustain cacao production, I don't think this anybody will think about midgets, right? Uh, yeah, uh, we don't like the midgets because some of that, these guys, uh, the next one, is responsible for Zika virus and all kinds of nasty stuff. But yet, we love chocolate, right? So, um, so the whole point is that, and, and this guy's too from Bolivia, uh, that is in cacao systems. And as you can see, it's not all one size fits all. Uh, depending on the place, the location, you know, what matters in a cacao system differs, right? So it's not just one thing that you know, rules everything. Uh, and I, I found this to be fascinating. When you go to Indonesia, 
um, uh, this is uh, so South Sul Sulawesi, ants play a very important role in cacao pollination. Um, the same goes to aphids. Uh, I heard in the uh, first panel how nasty aphids are to some trees. <laughs> uh, this is Northern Peru. If you love chocolate, you gotta love these bugs. Uh, so, uh, in a nutshell, um, in, 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 in this, from this case study, we, we noticed that um, pollination service, uh, more than antibiotic factors, uh, were very critical to cacao resilience. And, on, 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 and, and then that resilience uh, rested on the shoulders of these tiny little microscopic bags, uh, which means that protecting their populations uh, and making them thrive was vital to sustaining cacao production. Uh, so what I I'm trying to say is that when we are considering um, uh, how you know, to build or design resilient urban forests as an ecosystem, um, the question is what kind of functions and traits might determine uh, their resilience in any respective uh, climatic um, situation. Um, yeah, so uh, in sum, uh, trees are a fraction of uh, a more complex interdependent ecosystems as biological community. Uh, the survival of forests depends on the resilience of the overall community. And so identifying the core community members that holds its structure and function can predict resilience. Resilience predictability can inform resilience design. Uh, to survive future uncertainties, urban forests must be designed uh, for resilience. And so expanding existing concepts and tools uh, to sort of uh, accommodate ways that we can measure urban forests. The way I was able to measure uh, what might play the core critical uh, role in, in cacao systems. If you're able to do that, uh, perhaps uh, in a way that reflects reality, uh, uh, that might probably be imminent in uh, how we think about the future of forest adaptation. And I, this morning, I just wrote this out of the bloom. I don't know, probably too much coffee. The nature is full of mysteries, and therefore, um, uh, there is always more than meets the eye. So the humility as we uncover these mysteries is that is what is also needed for us to safeguard it, even for our own varied interests. Thank you for your attention. working yes okay thank you um, thank you everybody for your wonderful uh, presentations um, I'm going to start with a couple of reflections and provocations maybe to start uh, some sort of discussion among ourselves and then I'll open it up for the rest of the audience um, a few uh, weeks ago I was reading um, I was looking again at the book uh, Forests, uh, The Shadow of Civilization by Robert Park Harrison. Uh, the epilogue, the last chapter of the, of the book is called um, The Ecology of Finitude. And it begins with a, with a passage or the, with a fable that uh, Gary was referring to at the beginning of the, during his introductory remarks, you know, the Giambattista Jean Vico's uh, passage in the New Science where he describes, you know, like this, uh, the history of civilization as I think it was from first the forest, after that the huts, then the villages, ne the next the cities, and finally the academies. And in this, uh, sequence of uh, different forms of inhabitation that we read in that uh, fable, it seems that every, uh, what uh, Harrison tells us when interpreting the passage uh, from Vico, it, he tells us that every one of these steps requires the opening up of a clearing in the forest. No? First humans inhabit the forest. In order to introduce a hut, you need to open a clearing. In order to introduce the village, you need to expand that clearing. In order to introduce the city, you need to go even further. So the drawing that we see there is that of a clearing that keeps growing and growing and growing to the point that at some point, 
from the center of the clearing, you no longer see the forest. You, you, and, and you feel that you're living in, a, in an utopia. You, know, like you forget that the point of departure was the forest. And I think it's, it's, it's an interesting topological inversion, no? where we see at the beginning a little clearing in the center of the forest. And as the clearing grows, we see we begin to reintroduce patches of that forest back into the clearing, which is, uh, I guess, what the, what, the urban, what the urban forest condition that we're discussing here is. No? So it's a transposition of that initial um, figure of that initial condition back into. So I, I want, there's something, I guess, about coding, encoding, and decoding. You know, we read that initial condition. We codify it, we introduce uh, meanings, and we, introduce, uh, we project on it our values, our aesthetic canons, etc. And then we have to decode that significance back into, into that new patch that we introduce into, 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 the, into, the, into the city, into the clearing. So I don't know if, if, if this image uh, triggers any, any, any reactions from, from, from any of you. I wonder if, you know, if a couple of you at least started by saying, what, is, what do we actually mean by an urban forest? What of that primeval forest uh, continues to exist in the, in the urban forest? Or what is the past? What is, the, you know, what is, is, is that notion of the forest different, what it was in the past, from what it is in the future, in the present, to what it will be in the future? I don't know. I, I wonder what this topological inversion uh, suggests to you guys. Maybe um, the first comment is that um, both Vico, but we could cite Rousseau too and uh, other thinkers of the 18th century. It's a construction. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's a construction and uh, maybe we could go one step further and ask why do they in the century of enlightenment need such a model to come back to this original place of forest whereas uh, uh, wild nature as we know at least in the european tradition until the 17th century is the enemy it's a place of the devil etc so something happened in the 18th century and there is the invention of the myth of the good forests and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. that would be my first comment. Mm -hmm. Nick? I mean, I think for me, it makes me think about, um, you know, as you describe, as that condition progresses, as the, um, as the city grows and overwhelms the forest, initially the act of clearing was kind of the precondition for settlement and settler colonialism as we've come to know it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the forest was the enemy to be conquered and all the you know bad things that could be constructed to motivate that activity. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, with the remnants that we're left with, each remnant, because of its scarcity, acquires an incredible value. And mm -hmm. as Max uh, pointed out, the incredible uh, social value for many urbanites, this is their main interface with a larger nature and a kind of a, a stepping stone to, um, you know, uh, getting in touch with uh, this non-human world. Um, but also for ecosystems, right? These are remaining little refugia or stepping stones, what have you. Um, and so their function becomes even that more precious, right? And mm -hmm. so then all the ecological dynamics of scale, size, connectivity, or isolation become really important to consider. And, you know, especially if we do want these forest patches to work socioecologically and not just for one or the other. Mm -hmm. Maybe one. Uh, 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 a small thing to add, well, if you think about European tradition, you have for roughly 1,000 years, uh, all the cities are fortified, mm -hmm. so they're closed, completely closed system. So there is no such place for, uh, for an urban forest, for a forest. It's a closed system. And uh, the forest is, per definition, outside. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, it's very late, I think it's Ferrara in the 15th century where you have a transformation of the city and where you have small urban forests before you wouldn't find them, mm -hmm. just for structural reasons. 
I don't know how it, we could translate this into a more global reflection on all the cities of the world, etc. But at least for the European example, it's uh, quite clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, any Max, please. I'll build off of what Michael was saying there, that and we presented something that was very, I would say, northeast-centric or eastern-centric uh, in terms of our urban history and how cities have developed, but the distribution of these forests across uh, are dependent upon the biophysical as well as the social history. So, of course, in Europe, we have peri-urban forests where silviculture might be um, more developed just because they were woodlots or they were seen as for their services, either through harvest or foraging. Um, what struck me from what you were saying about the invisible, to me, forests and cities remain invisible that they have built up around them. Mm -hmm. um, I find within my colleagues and, and just talking to people, very few people realize that there are forests, what we would say in the traditional sense, still in our cities. And if you look at resource maps, um, many cities don't map them out by these types. So they're not even mapped. Uh, so we can't quantify how much we have, what they provide. So part of this work of urban silviculture is shining a light on these spaces, these fragments or new emerging ones that do exist in these mm -hmm. cities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so maybe we could take some of those comments, I mean, if we go from topology <clears throat> to typology, I guess, you know, like you, Michael, brought this image of the different ways in which a forest can be attached or, or linked to, to, to a city. And uh, Max and Nicholas were talking about these uh, different um, elements that, that one might find in what we call an urban forest, which are the street, the yard, the parks uh, and, uh, and what we would call, I guess, the more traditional idea of the forest, you know, something that is a remnant or something that is uh, more massively um, predicted. So I guess when we think about the idea of the traditional forest, and I guess this also goes to, uh, to, to what you were showing, Nick, at the end, you know, like these two different historical images of, the historical image of Yosemite compared to the current image of Yosemite, you know, what we think a forest is, is like a very thick, uh, dense, um, you know, it's a construction, as you were saying, you know, the idea of the forest is a construction and we have a particular image of what a forest is. So in what, what would be, <coughs> what would be the morphology, what, what is needed in order to, what, what, do you, what elements of the vegetation that we find in the city might be considered as part of the urban forest beyond, the, beyond those remnants or those thickly planted areas? When we think of the street, can this, uh, to what extent can the vegetation growing on a street be considered part of, a, of an urban forest? Does it need to be linked? I don't know. Th can it, does it need to be linked in landscape ecology terms? You know, that, that, does it need a critical distance from a larger patch? Or what, what, where does the urban forest end or when, where, where, where does it begin? Uh, so being the ecologist on the, uh, okay, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think actually um, the term urban forest has perhaps become a little problematic in okay. my opinion, because we find ourselves tripping over making this distinction of what is urban, what's not. So uh, you said forest is a construct. As an ecologist, I think there are certain functional biophysical aspects that make a forest distinct from mm -hmm. a grassland, from a uh, non-forest, and certainly from a street tree, a mm -hmm. single isolated tree. Now, the term urban forest, why I introduced that whole uh, city model, is it's really urban tree canopy or urban greenness, and that has huge implications at a city scale, at a policy scale, at a planning scale. Um, so I like to think in terms of greenness and canopy and then think more about these operational units, which really have distinct eco ecological stresses and concerns in terms of management or design on those. So I try to unpack that immediately because, and hence every one of my presentations, I have to define urban forest here, but forest is in that term for a reason. And, mm -hmm. it, and I think mm -hmm. we should still hold what forest is biologically. And then we can add on social meaning and, and think about an individual tree as having more cultural value, but um, let's not lose sight of the forest in, mm -hmm. in that terminology. Well, I'm, I'm actually just thinking about the, some of the images that Ache was showing that the AI thinks mm -hmm. is an urban forest. Um, and it strikes me that 
uh, the trees on buildings is a typology that we're seeing more and more of, um, especially through this conflation of green and forest. And so, um, you know, the famous question of like, why do architects keep putting trees on buildings? Um, and I think it's for a lot of those symbolic and um, uh, emotional and uh, aesthetic qualities. Um, I guess the next question that came to my mind looking at those images is, wow, that's a really thin concrete slab holding mm. all of those trees. And so I think that goes to some of these uh, uh, ecological prerequisites for a healthy and functioning living system. And those are the roots, those are the soil volumes, those are the resources those trees need. And so you know, I think the kinds of um, urban forests, in quotes, that the AI thinks might be coming are possible if we build all of those prerequisites in. And I think, um, you know, maybe not making this arbitrary distinction between what is or isn't a forest, but actually rooting uh, the definition in those ecological um, prerequisites and um, functional rules. You know? OK, um, maybe one last uh, comment. Gary, do you want to ask? Huh? Yeah, one, one, last, one last thing, maybe um, when trying to maybe link a little bit the talk by Nick and, and, and Max with Achen Pong. Uh, when, you know, I was, you know, when we think about silviculture you know, at the local scale, you, you showed us these many different techniques and spatial conditions. And then we see in Achen Pong's presentation this larger scale. Uh, shifting landscapes, and I was, you know, I was thinking like, we tend to think of the techniques of silviculture as something that is synchronic, you know, something that needs to take place in a particular, uh, you know, in, in something. It was a presentation. It was presented in a kind of typological way, you know, like these are different interventions that might take place in different conditions. But is silvi to what extent is silviculture? To what extent are silvicultural practices being introduced? to get the soil or the forest ready for the next event that might cause a major disappearance of a forested area that needs to be where the clock is going to be reset and it might, that ecosystem might collapse and might need to be reformed, might form in a completely different, in a completely different way. To what extent are silvicultural practices being introduced to prepare the, the, for, the, the, for those future scenarios with a more resilient um, planning, I guess. Um, sure, so, so silviculture, as I said, it, it, it can meet any goals that could be timber, uh, but certainly there's ecological silviculture is at the forefront right now, and we can think about climate resilient silviculture and climate resilient forestry. Um, urban silviculture is closely tied to that in terms of it's an adaptive approach. So I would say Silviculture and its best practice is always doing what you're saying. It's thinking about creating a resilient condition. Uh, perhaps in the light of climate change, you're expanding the number of species that you're considering. Uh, we don't know what the next invasive pest or pathogen will be. You know, right now it's beech leaf disease. What will be next? So you can't put um, all your eggs in one basket in terms of species and biodiversity. So if we're thinking about resilience, you know, I'm taking a tree-centric perspective there, but of course we have to think about the soil and above and below ground interactions with other organisms. So um, there are treatments that will facilitate the health and promote a resilient soil biota that would in turn support perhaps more resilient uh, trees. And so the, there are all these prescriptions and they occur at different scales. And we might think of them as a patchwork of treatments as well, right? So if we think of a mosaic of silvicultural treatments, that at a, at a, as you scale back at a landscape scale, will provide more resilience. So it's all about these nested approaches um, that give you something to fall back on with that next unknown stressor. Thank you all, this is fantastic. Um, uh, I, I have a question um, that I, any one of you could answer it involves all the presentations. One of the key functions in the um, ecological circumstance of the urban forest is connectivity. Um, you know, we just planted three blocks of a street with 96 um, substantially sized live oak trees in, in a place where live oaks thrive. 
Uh, we intended to have actually a fully connective trench for soil well over the um, prescriptive 1,200 cubic feet per tree. Um, that got cut back uh, due to cost and other issues. But um, Michael, in your typologies, which I find really, it's quite an elegant diagram, there's one missing, which I think is the networked system, where all of those patches, even the three inside, but also even the Bois de Boulogne and the Bois de Vincennes, are connected. If we are going to have um, a larger public realm in the streets where we have fewer cars in future, and if we can build connective systems of both soil that we can manage and trees, then Aceh's um, key factor in resilience, which is pollination, would be one characteristic that might produce continuity in the same way that um, Stephen Handel's f mini forest uh, would be self-regulating because it would attract birds, which would extend the population. So this is a real question for any one of you. Is, is it p the possibility that our cities someday have fully connective networks through the uh, inclusion of the street tree environment? I'll jump in. Yeah, I, uh, yes, I believe so. And so um, I'll, I'll you know, walk back some of my statements about that, that it is about still thinking about greenness across the city in this interconnectedness. I would say ecologically, we think about connectivity through a functional lens. And so it doesn't have to be physical. Uh, pollinators, many of them can fly. Seeds can disperse. Birds fly. Um, so it's thinking about that functional connectivity. So does the soil need to be connected? Perhaps. Um, but there's also spores for, for, that can, can move. Maybe so, con connective so that you can have mycorrhizal activity. You know, yes, throughout. yes. So connectivity can take different, d different forms. And, and I think we have to, again, build up that resilience of having different types of connectivity and thinking about the organisms uh, that, that we're trying to connect. Um, and I would also scale up beyond the city to think about the networks, what we're calling the matrix in this case might be the natural lands in between the cities and thinking of cities as stepping stones as in the Northeast, right? The megalopolis here, um, cities perhaps are the stepping stones for our natural populations or otherwise could be seen as huge barriers to movement. I thank you for your um, presentations and inspiration. I, perhaps I would like to reflect a little bit with you on the concept of disturbance that we are so afraid of. And at the same time, we want to avoid and also design to avoid disturbance. So in a time that in a way we are mesmerized by uh, the idea of wilderness, and we know that is also a myth, how do we fit this idea of wilderness with disturbance, because disturbance is also part of wilderness. So perhaps to summarize, how can we also design for disturbance? I mean, I, I think that's the question. Um, how do we design with disturbance? Mm -hmm. And I think part of that comes from um, just starting to have a, a better handle on cause and effect on um, you know, how much disturbance and what critical thresholds flip a system into a completely different state of being. Um, Nigel Dunnett, um, the um, uh, professor in Sheffield, um, writes about uh, design disturbance on green roofs, for example, right, where uh, a certain amount of disturbance opens up space for colonization, for other, um, for species diversity, for soil biota. So I think um, through kind of better understandings of ecological processes, we become more able to design with disturbance with urban silviculture, if the system does not respond in an urban forest the way it might be expected to in a non-urban system, um, the prescriptions need to change. Otherwise, you know, you're designing with techniques that are going to cause effects that are 
unanticipated. And so I think part of getting that understanding back into landscape practice, you know, the way that um, back in the collaborative years of Olmsted and Pinchot, learning and working with one another, I think that will give us more tools, give us a, a better ability to design creatively without going too far. Yeah, probably one could combine your two questions. So there is a maybe a form of uh, exaggerated connectivity, which goes too far. And if I see the AI images, I mean, it looks nice, but it's a nightmare. I mean, who would like to live like this? I mean, it's beautiful an image. I mean, it's a beautiful photograph. It's a beautiful image. But, and this is not only AI. There is a guy from Belgium, Luc Schuiten. He has been drawing for the last 40 years uh, the, the green cities of the future. And it looks great when you look to it as a work of art. But if you think everything which comes with it, I think it's totally exaggerated. And maybe if we look to the history of landscape architecture and urbanism in the last 200 years, we see that there was always a movement back and forth between extreme uh, forms of almost being extremely natural and the wilderness. And then we go back to something formal. So I think we are in the midst of uh, what I call the religion of nature. And so as the religion of nature replaced all the other religious forms, almost. Uh, of course, uh, this maybe explains why we'll want to go so far. I, I would just build up. I, I thought it was striking, you know, avoiding disturbance or you, you brought up there. Of course, that's the legacy out west, right, is avoiding fire. So um, silviculture at roots embraces disturbance that's in, inherent to these natural systems and it is designed disturbance that silviculturists are, are bringing. Um, I think just with the amount of people, different stakeholders, the use of these urban spaces that we can start to bring design with the capital D into that, that process, right, as opposed to um, someone wearing chaps and a, and a chainsaw. Um, Dr. Atta Boateng, Ayeku. I seek your advice on a particular problem. As you know, I took the, the Harvard Forestry course from Ernie Gould and Walter Lyford, followed by a soils course in the Department of um, Pathobiology at Johns Hopkins, and I chose to live in Beltsville, which is the home of the Agricultural Research Center. The U.S. Congress, in its wisdom, has proposed relocating the Bureau of in Printing and Engraving from downtown Washington, D.C. to the edge of the Agricultural Research Center in Beltsville. Those inks have to be toxic. If a dollar bill inadvertently left in a pocket can, receive, can survive repeated washings in a washing machine. I have tried contacting Steny Hoyer, one of my kind of representatives, former majority leader of the Democratic caucus, and their only answer is, oh, it will be a green building. What can we do? As an addendum, my brother Jonathan F.P. Rose wrote a book, The Well-Tempered City, Live Where You Work. Why don't they relocate to Hyattsville, where for over two decades I had a career with the federal government, that has an urban transit system, presumably it has, um, you know, okay um, water um, treatment facilities. In Beltsville, they are now, only now, redoing um, Powder Mill Road so that it has wastewater treatment, which it never did, wastewater management systems, which it never did when it was originally built. So what can we do to stop this potential disaster? Thank you very much. Ne pas. So she also spoke um, a bit of my native language. <laughs> Um, should I say um, city policy makers should take forest ecology courses as a prerequisite? <laughs> um, 
Um, I, I think um, I try to uh, stay away from the, the politics of life uh, and, 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 and then trust science. Um, uh, I, but, I, but I think um, uh, I think I was trying to give a premise um, in, in my opening um, that um, uh, as human beings, uh, our ancestries were really close to nature. And uh, over the, I don't know, millennia or so, uh, we've sort of moved away uh, from nature. And uh, I'm just being speculative. I wonder if that also um, affects, um, so I cause some sort of evolution of our own behavior uh, in a way that uh, we don't feel really connected to nature. And I'm saying this because um, uh, when you travel around and you interact with people from different places, sometimes you can tell who come from uh, a place like hardcore New York, Bronx, and someone who grew up really connected to nature. Uh, and, 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 and there is just this uh, intangible, I don't know how to really you know, put words to it. There is, there, it, it has different effect on who we are as humanity, human beings. And so um, um, I, I think um, it is important to find a way to convince ourselves that um, being close to nature is part of who we are and we should embrace it. We're going to take one last, oh, one last question. Is that okay yet? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We're running a few minutes behind, but we'll take this one, okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists. I uh, appreciate being here today. And I want to echo exactly you know, what was just said. I have over roughly three decades of experience connecting people to nature, various um, ethnicities, demographics, ages, and what was briefly mentioned in reference to the growing of, you know, maybe the hut and then the village, et cetera, pulls us, has pulled Western culture away from the natural world, right? Those who remained were savages or, you know, um, uh, uneducated, et cetera. And if you look back at those cultures who are, who were and still are connected to nature and look at some of the poems or the statements, that profound. If we had listened, we wouldn't be here today. And what I find is that, like I tell people, do you, do you have a dog? Yeah. Well, do you like it? Of course, I love it. Well, how? Well, I got it as a puppy. What do we hung out? Great. Oh, where it likes to eat, where it likes to sleep, etc. Okay, so what happened? Oh, I, I love it. It's the connection. It's the awareness. And we, as a Western culture, has to go back. I've looked at various indigenous groups across the world. Luckily, I've been mentored, various people, various things. And when, when you t take a little kid at a young age, he, her, they, and you connect them with nature, I don't mean saying, let's come and look at this tree, which is fine. I'm talking about a deep connection with the natural world where their, their culture changes. They're not they're in the Western culture, but not of it. And lastly, what I will say is it leads you, and I, I know this for almost 30 years, it leads you to a place of understanding, love, compassion, empathy, and connection. And like, lastly, is people who live this way, they taught their kids this. And it wasn't like a school. It was every day they would go, let's say, tracking or hunting, take only what you need and nothing more. We need to save it for, you know, this animal, et cetera, et cetera. So in any way, because you had mentioned how we can educate, and that needs, I forget your name, sir, I'm sorry. You mentioned the connection. It's, it's extremely important that we blend those two together so you have that connection so we're not in the place where we currently are. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, the, the one quick response I would have is uh, that connection starts by having places where it can form. And so, uh, you know, I look at cities that have threaded, um, you know, 
natural uh, systems through backyards and small streams and ravines, you know, um, walks to school that can mostly follow wooded and non-trafficked uh, uh, walking paths. And um, that's a design opportunity and it's a, it's a, an, a retrofit opportunity for cities that were not developed that way. They were developed on a different logic. I think we need to leave it here, uh, Gary. Yeah, thank you, Pablo. Thank you, um, Nick, Ache, um, Max, and Michael. Stimulating discussion. We're going to break for uh, lunch, um, uh, and you have a little bit more than 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Uh, I just want to mention that the Chow House has very good bowls. Um, faculty and students have um, been lining up, and that's just down the uh, north end of the building. There's a lovely um, cafe in Harvard Art Museum, which is a block and a half that way. And then there's also a clover um, sort of good fast food restaurant in the Science Center, which is a block that way. Thanks, and we'll be back here at 2.15. <laughs>